we're here to talk about the nature of time, about what it is that makes us think that there's a particular direction to time or an arrow to time, about what it is that makes us think that moving into the past is somehow different to moving into the future. Now, on the one hand, this seems like a really obvious question to answer, right? Because when we see a scene playing out in our everyday lives, it seems immediately too obvious to us if we were to record that scene and play it backwards that we were doing so. We never see, for example, an egg that's cracked suddenly reforming into a perfect whole egg. And if we were to see something like that, it would seem incredibly unnatural to us. But there's a problem with this. And that problem is that Newton's laws of nature, which are supposedly the fundamental laws that govern how the individual particles and atoms interact with each other, Newton's laws are said to be time reverse invariant or time symmetric. So what does that mean? That means that if we were to zoom in to that same everyday scene so that we could see each individual particle and how it's moving and how it's bouncing around, if we were to record that and play that in reverse, we would have literally no way of telling whether we were watching that film being played forwards in time or backwards in time. And the reason we would have no way of knowing is because Newton's laws of nature run exactly the same way forwards and backwards in time. So we have a contradiction here, right? On the one hand, we have a clear asymmetry and directionality to our large-scale observations of the world. However, when we zoom right in so we can see the individual particles and atoms, we've lost that asymmetry, we've lost that directionality. So if there really is a direction to time, if the future really is different to the past, then the reason for why this must be cannot be found in Newton's laws of nature alone. It must be coming from some other source. Entropy, signified by the letter S, as we move forward in time, always either stays the same or gets larger. So we never ever see a fall in entropy as we move forward in time. So let's imagine we have a horizontal box and we divide this box into eight compartments and we have 16 marbles. So to start with, all the marbles are in one particular compartment. What we're going to do is we're going to perform an experiment with this, right? We're going to pick a marble at random and we're going to take it out of the box. And then we're going to put it back in the box, but we're going to do it in a random compartment. And we're going to repeat this process over and over and over and over and over again. By the time we've repeated this experiment a billion, a trillion times, even though it's very possible that we could, by chance, end up in this original position, we're much more likely to find a really even spread of particles around. The particles are almost randomly, chaotically distributed throughout each of the compartments equally. The only reason that this is the case comes down to what's called the occupation numbers. It's the number of ways that we can arrange the particles for each different scenario, right? So, in this top scenario, there's only one way of arranging them, so all the marbles are in compartment number five. So the occupation number for that is one. But if I am looking at this scenario, where we have two marbles in each box, then the number of ways of arranging those are 817 billion. Right? And this is why it's just so unlikely that if we did this experiment a billion times, we'd end up back here. Because there are just so many more ways of arranging the marbles so that they end up in this configuration than to arrange them so that they're all in compartment number five. So this example highlights what we mean by entropy. And entropy is a really important concept in thermodynamics. And what it means is, how many ways are there of arranging all the particles in the system so that they give rise to these macroscopic features which I'm observing? 
This initially highly ordered state has a very, very low entropy. There's only one way of arranging all the particles so that they're in this compartment. Whereas there are 817 billion ways of arranging them so that there's two in each compartment. So what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that in nature, whenever we start with a highly ordered state, and we see these all around us, right? We have people, we have plants, we have planets, we have stars. Whenever we have such an ordered state where all the atoms and all the particles have to be arranged just so for that state to exist, then that is something that's fundamentally unstable. And it's fundamentally unstable simply because as the particles begin to jiggle around and as they rearrange themselves and as they move, which they must because everything is always moving, then the number of ways in which they can arrange themselves to be more evenly distributed are so, so, so much more numerous than the number of ways in which they can arrange themselves to be in that particular ordered state. And this tallies with our experience of time passing. This is why we never see a broken egg reform. Even if we started with all the air in this room up in one box in the top corner and then released it, it would fill the room and it would never fly up back into the top corner. And that's not because that's impossible by the laws of nature, it's just because it's so vastly improbable. Now we started off by saying, right, well, we need to define an arrow of time or what makes us think that there's an arrow or direction to time. And our common sense notion is of time as something that sort of chugs along independently of the rest of the universe and something that sits apart but is always moving on constantly. And now we haven't found that here, but what we have found is something that is consistent with our experience of time passing. Because all those examples I gave you of systems changing forward in time, they're not really changing forward in time. They're moving from a state of low entropy to a state of high entropy. And that is what we pin our arrow of time to. We introduce time ourselves and we say, our experience of time passing is analogous to being on this curve from going a low entropy state to a high entropy state. We've talked about individual systems like um, the air in this room or like a person or like a planet, but really it's the universe as a whole that can be modeled as one of these closed thermodynamic systems. And it's that which gives a direction or an arrow of time to the entire universe. And now we have this very unusual picture that time is no longer something that's independent, that chugs along, but instead, time is just a description or a function of the arrangement of particles in the universe, right? Because the universe is one of these closed systems and the universe itself is moving from a state of low entropy to a state of high entropy. We found a definition of time which is not independent and is not something sort of uncanny or otherworldly, but is really just a statement of the arrangement of particles in the universe, of how the universe is set up. Time is now something physical. It's something which is linked to the order and the chaos of the universe. And what we found is that the direction of time is simply this direction of increasing entropy. It's saying that you can start with all the order you want, you're always gonna end up in this highly chaotic, disordered state. And it is that which makes us think there's an arrow of time. It's that which makes us think there's a direction of time. And it's that which makes us think that moving into the future really is different to moving into the past.